Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom. Today is my co-host, Brad Lyons. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. So this is a special podcast, um, uh, mostly for clients of our firm and those who uh, are maybe interested in uh, our thoughts on portfolios and the economy and what's happened this quarter, what might happen or what happened last quarter, what might happen this quarter. Thus, our quarter three uh, podcast review, which goes along with our uh, letter that goes out to clients. You know, it was an interesting quarter. Um, and given the fact that when we manage our portfolios for clients, they're based on the financial plan that is produced, given their goals, their wishes, their desires, their resources, and what they want to accomplish, it's all tied together. Now, we don't look at these things, you know, from a management standpoint on a month-to-month basis, but more over years, over years, and market cycles, and so on. But we keep up with this on a regular basis because all this is inclusive in, in the data that we utilize in order to make portfolio decisions. You know, what I find interesting is um, over the next 20 years, 30 years, it's almost like none of this even really matters. If you have a long time focus or a long term focus, right? Right. I definitely never want to get into a situation where we turn into like CNBC or Jim Cramer and we're talking about the moment right now and the sky's falling or maybe it's blue skies ahead or whatever's happening. William Bernstein had a, had a famous saying. He, um, he's the father of modern portfolio theory, I believe. He had a famous saying that um, in the short term, the stock market is a is a uh, voting machine and the long term it's a weighing machine and so we always have to focus on that that we have to be focused long term not what's happening uh, tomorrow but also i will say i get emails from from clients every single day maybe as many as 10 15 emails and kind of the theme lately has has been a lot of fear and i think a lot of that fear uh, is based from people i know a lot of that fear is based from people that are trying to sell things they're starting to sell a subscription. They're trying to sell uh, more viewers for their show so that they get higher paid advertising, right? Uh, I think the latest one, and we'll cover it here, was was uh, the U.S. is going to default on its on its bills, and they just we need to be out of the stock market. You know, another one is that uh, U.S. dollar, and this has been out here for about two decades. The U.S. dollar is going to tank, and I need a lot of gold in my portfolio. And I said, well, where'd you hear that? Well, I see all these Fox News commercials or I see, you know, or newsletters. Um, And quite honestly, you know, (laughs) it's it's the far left and political. I I hate to get political here, but we're getting political. (laughs) Uh, The far left does not have the fear mongering that the far right does, because all the newsletters that I see from the far right are just. It's doomsday. It's horrible, right? Yeah. And there's always an action. You read all this. Now, here's the action item. And that action item is never, never what I would consider sound investing. And then on the the far left side, it's the government will take care of it. Don't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) We've heard that. We've heard that for decades, too. We have a solution. We have a solution. (laughs) Yeah. Pretty much since FDR. Right. The government is going to take care of it. One of my favorites on these commercials, you know, speaking of sponsorships and so on, is these really well-known celebrity endorsements for gold or annuities or reverse mortgages. I mean, these are well-known, well-respected actors and and athletes and people of yeah. prominence. You know, they were kind of they were, they were, yeah. a kick out of thing. Well, if, if the product is so good, if the investment is such a great idea, why does it take such a well known spokesperson in order to tell in me that I it. need to do it? Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, it's like you don't see anybody on TV well known going, brush your teeth. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you don't see anybody saying, saying shower daily. Yes, um, exactly. You know? No, I mean, they're and they're good at what what they did. I mean, they they are do. They're good at acting. That doesn't mean that they're good at math. No. And they're acting on that commercial in order to receive what a paycheck, right? Just like the annuity person selling an annuity says this is in your best interest. He calms or she calms all your fears about the future, and your future is now safe because you bought this annuity. But yet they're getting the largest payday, upwards of ten percent commission, and selling you that product. And then the company gets even more. Year uh, and, after and, year after year you know, on those I, fees. I'm the shame. I'm ashamed to say it. I started my career off in that in that world, and 
the first six months of my career, my boss used to always say, there's three people in this relationship and two of them better be making money, meaning the advisor at the company. <laughs> right. So right. anyway, uh, we could go down this this tangent for, for a long time, but just remember that, that fear is never, an, never should be a, a motivator for an investment strategy. No, it's not. Uh, and, and so it, we, have to, we have to understand what's happening today in the markets because we, we need to know why things are happening to the portfolios. But this is all very short-term, short-term analysis. It's like walking down the street only looking at the toes of your feet. You're going to run into something. I mean, we're starting to see it now, right, with people in their, on their mobile devices. They're trying to focus on the mobile device, and they run into people, fall in the fountains, run into the telephone pole, what have you. But that's, that's what short-term trading is like, is walking down the street looking at your toes or trying to drive your car only looking at the hood. You have to have a long-term focus on, on your investments. And if you don't have a long-term, meaning um, you want to invest for something that's five years from now, we're generally advocates if you hold it in cash or extreme short-term bonds that try to get a little higher yield. Because over five years, there's a good chance that the, the stock market might give you a negative uh, loss. And, and we're forgetting that. We're forgetting that over the last decade. Well, it, it feels like it's been such a great run in this stock market for the past decade that people don't remember that there are times when the market does go down. And we're going to exclude 2020, you know, well, for, for, for that comment. And the yeah. reason is because that was an external event. That was, a, that was not a, a financial crisis. That was a medical, a health crisis that occurred. And look how quickly it came back. After we it, figured it out. It was. But you know what it also was? It was like a millennial crisis. You know how millennials are get kind of, this is a stereotype, but they get tagged for wanting everything right away. So they got a really fast crisis and a really fast recovery, right? Yeah. I mean, I had to endure. I, I, I bought a wealth management firm in 2007. I did, had to endure the top all the way through the bottom with brand new faces sitting in front of me, right? That was a three, four year ordeal. That was. To work through all that right. mess. That's why I wanted to exclude 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so 2020 wasn't really, uh, I mean, it wasn't a market crisis. It was more of a market opportunity, it really. Was. And we did well. You, you did well with uh, the rebalancing and, and processes of all that, and our, and our clients did well. So well, let's go ahead and, that's and the uh, point. let's go ahead and get into. Um, I guess, Brad, let's just follow the, the, the highlight of our newsletter here that you are uh, about to send out. Uh, so we'll, we'll just start with the overall economy uh, over the last quarter and over the last year. You know, the economy is actually performing pretty well. We're looking at a, a growth rate that was reported in the third quarter for the second quarter because we're, we're on a lag here. Second quarter was uh, growing at a 6.7% growth rate which is really a strong economy. And as we went into the, the third quarter, and what began to happen is companies began to increase their guidance for investors, expecting a, a good third quarter of, of earnings. And sure enough, that did happen. So like somewhere in the neighborhood of 87% of the companies in the S&P 500 reported earnings higher than analyst expectations. So that is a tremendous gain. Now in the stock market, there's is sometimes there's a lag. There's not always a direct correlation because what had happened is you went through the July and August and by the beginning of September, the market was at an all-time high. I mean, it looked like we were just going to keep going and going and going. But that's not normal to, you know, own to our just past conversation. Right. In any normal year, you're looking at a pullback in the market of 5%, perhaps three or four times a year on average. We've only had one up until this recent quarter. It was back in March and February. So what happened about beginning of March, or excuse me, beginning of September, is we began looking at the investors began to look forward you know, beyond the third quarter. They, those numbers were already getting baked in, as they saw in the stock market rise through July and August. And they started looking beyond, and what we were looking at at that point in time was an increase in COVID cases through the new Delta variant, and it was beginning to rise in, in the market. So investors began to be concerned about how long would this take to work us right through the system, and we can talk a little bit more about this, but it's already turned over on a seven-day moving average. But So we did, then finally saw the second pullback of the market in September. By the end of September, major indices, the Dow, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, all were showing a downward trend of 5% or more. That doesn't mean that for the quarter, but just in a swoop 
from beginning of September to the end of September, we're seeing a downward trend. But by the end of the quarter, the whole quarter, the returns for the, the S&P were about flat. They were up about a half a percent. If you go point to point, it's like nothing happened. Right. It was a flat <laughs> It flat was flat quarter. for the quarter. The Dow was off a little bit more, maybe a point and a half after that. And the NASDAQ was a little down a little bit further. But nonetheless, we're starting out the quarter now. We've just had a pullback. Quite often after pullbacks, we go see a rise in the market. We talked a little bit about that. The large caps, the small caps, the different sectors and how they performed in the market in the third quarter really is the interesting story there. Well, when we hop into that a little bit. Well, we saw the large caps uh, uh, essentially flat, maybe up a little bit. Small caps were off after a pullback. Small caps have had a terrific run since since the past 12 months, up over 50% in the last 12 months. And you recall, Casey, last August, we had this conversation in August of 2020 where we rotated into small caps. Right. Okay, we had a very small allocation of small caps prior to that. I think it was just 1% in our all-equity portfolio. We, we decided to take advantage of what we saw going forward in the marketplace relative to small caps, interest rates where they were, where the economy was and how it was growing and coming back in, in last fall. And we moved to an 11% allocation in, in small caps, which we were able to take advantage of that. And that's in our all equity portfolio. That's correct. In our all, and the other portfolios have a you know proportionately less in our blended models after that. So we're, we're looking at the different asset classes, large cap, small cap, and then you get into different sectors this last quarter. Some of the sectors that, that did well, technology did well. It was up relatively you know higher than the S&P 500. Over the past year, technology, real estate, were both up almost 30%. You know, in one year. And so we have allocations to that in our portfolio in a smaller sense than the overall portfolio, maybe five or 6% to each one of those. And what that does is it allows us to try and get what's something called alpha. Alpha is something that investors and portfolio managers look for in their portfolio relative to the benchmark that they're gauging themselves against. So relative to the S&P 500, both technology and real estate outperform that. So we were able to gain what's called a little alpha in the portfolio. And when over long periods of time, little bits of return above and beyond excess the benchmark add up in the portfolio over and over and over and we're able to realize those gains for portfolios and our clients through increased income to them in, in their retirement so overall it was a a quarter in which we did well to maintain you know the the current allocations with expectations being that as we're moving into the the fourth quarter it's expected through increased or so analysts increased thoughts on how well corporations are going to report for third quarter and then how well they will do in the fourth quarter we're looking for those both to rise interest rates are still low liquidity is still very high in, in the marketplace and and that's certainly something to talk about when you talk about what's going to happen going forward and whether the federal reserve is going to pull back on any of that but at the moment i think that the portfolios are, are well well positioned to take advantage of fourth quarter and going into 2022. I like looking at just different things, diff different random things. Yes. And over the last year, I found it very interesting that energy stocks, which got totally beat up in 2020, over the last year, energy stocks as a whole are up 92% over year over year. Right. Through the end of the uh, last quarter. Amazon is down 1% year over year. And Zoom which is like the hot stock of 2020, down 38% individual stocks, right? What I find interesting is there's hot stocks, there's hot sectors. And what I don't like having to do is make choices and where I could be wrong. I like being right all the time, right? <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so to, to mitigate that risk, that that's one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate for holding core index funds. One, they're cheap. Average cost is, of our portfolios is less than 0 0.007 of a percent per year. Everything trades for free today at TD Ameritrade or Schwab. And you can have great returns without having to bet the farm on one sector or what the dollar is going to do, right? And there are there are companies out there that will do that. They say, we believe over the next couple of years, this is the sector we want to be in. And they can be right. We have peers here, large competitors here who have done that only to be wrong for like a decade and start shedding clients left and right because they, they were picking the wrong individual securities. So it's, it's, it, it just makes sense to me inside 401k plans, which pretty much 
any respectable plan now is going to have a full suite of index funds to choose from. But even outside of that, keep keep costs low, maintain diversification, and focus long term. I think uh, will always be keys to uh, portfolio success. That doesn't mean that you can't dabble in a little side account with some individual stocks. A lot of our clients do that, uh, but it's not it's not something they're depending on for the rest of their life. Well, rotation in the stock market is something that's natural and something that's desired as an investor. And rotations are, are from different sectors. As, as like you mentioned, certain sectors get hot and certain sectors begin to cool off over time. What also is, is rotation is, is large cap to small cap, growth to value. For years, growth had outperformed value okay, in, in the stock market. And here now, we're seeing over the past 12 months and some of the more recent terms is that value has been outperforming growth. Now, it's very hard to, to pick that, okay, ahead of time. I mean, if you had a crystal ball and you could do that, I mean, you'd all be rich. Well, in know? the short term, I, I tell clients, uh, not often, but when they ask about strategies, in the short term, there's a lot of things we can do to juice up portfolios. But the problem is when you're wrong, you're going to undo three years of that. That's right. And, and it's just not worth the risk. Something else that I've, I'm going to get on my soapbox again. Uh, sorry about that, Brad. <laughs> so a couple years ago, iShares or BlackRock iShares came out with a whole suite of ESG funds, environmental, social, and governance funds. Now, I'm not here to advocate against ESG or even for ESG. I'm ESG neutral, okay? I see both sides of the argument on why you'd want to only support companies that have good environmental, social, and governance policies. However, most money in any portfolio is going to be in large cap stocks. So again, Every quarter, when you write your newsletter, Brad, I get load up all the ESG funds and I look at them versus their benchmarks. And what's interesting to me is that iShares ESG Aware, MSCI USA ETF, or the ticker is ESGU, versus IVV, the S&P 500. Now, this is where we got a little cross with, with BlackRock. We used to use a lot of BlackRock research and models and we started moving away from that very quickly when the CEO came out, uh, who's it, Larry Finn? Larry Fink. Fink, that's right. He came out and said, we're an, we're an ESG firm, and you know, you ha everyone has to be basically shoving this stuff down our throats, saying this is what you have to invest in. So immediately, being an independent fiduciary, and quite frankly, not a conformer to anything, <laughs> I immediately said, said, wait a minute, you, know, you don't force anything on me, I choose and and I start we started researching this. You and I did this together right when I think you uh, you joined us yep. a couple of years ago. And what's interesting is this concept that the S and P five hundred. These are some of the five hundred largest companies in the country. How is it that as a group they would not be moving more and more toward ESG, environmental, social, and governance policies? Why would they not be doing that? Because the government has, has dangled all of these carrots for them to do that. A lot of it being bad press if they don't do it. A lot of blackmailing probably. But the bottom line is that the ESG ranking of the S&P 500 is double A. The ESG ranking of the ESGU fund, the large cap fund in the U.S. It does have some, some small caps in it uh, as well, is basically the same. It's one number, one little thing off. So they're basically identical. So this is where I have a problem. This is where the problem enters in. I don't have a problem with ESG because the S&P 500 itself, they're all moving that direction. I have a problem that BlackRock is telling me to go buy a fund, the ESGU fund, right? For five times the cost of the S&P 500. So initially they said, oh, this is going to perform so much better. It's not, it's not a political thing at all. It's not a social thing at all. It's because it's going to perform better because these companies are just ahead of the times. That's what they said. But that's, that's a lie. At the time, it was performing when they came out with it, but it was back testing. It wasn't actually in the market. It, and anytime you have a new fund come out, you'll always see outperformance because they time it just right to get that. 
that's part of the marketing. Well, why would they, they not come out with a new fund if, if, the, <laughs> if it say, didn't look good? Right. right. They come out with a new fund and say, this is this is ESG and it's underperforming. Yeah. <laughs> this, but we think it's going to do really well. <laughs> but it's going, going to do really well in the future. Nobody's <laughs> yeah. going to buy that, right? Yeah. So you have to launch it at just the right time. I found that uh, uh, you know a lot of BlackRock people have suddenly appeared in the Biden White House. So I think there was a lot of clamoring for for uh, uh, power and position through this. But here's here's the main reason why BlackRock did it. It's because they can increase their revenue five times for the same thing. So year to date, the S&P 500 versus the the social or the ESG aware fund, it's uh, basically neck and neck. The difference is basically the fees. They're performing exactly the same. Over the last 12 months, they're basically performing the same. And the troublemakers, you could say, were the energy sector which I, I could dis, I would disagree if you look at, there's actually some energy companies that have pretty high ESG rank ratings, some higher than other tech sector uh, companies. So that's kind of a misnomer. And there's energy in there because of that. The new ESG funds are smarter in how they select things. But it's, it's a, it, the reason why they did it is because it played to um, modern day politics, right? And it increased their revenue five times. That's the only reason. Well, <laughs> it's hard to. to, to <laughs> I just it's I'm hard just saying to disagree some, with that. I, I'm I mean, just saying someone should call them out for it because, and I'm not talking about like the Vanguard S and P 500. I'm talking about their own product. It's the S and P 500 IVV versus ESGU. It's their own product. It's not, you know, BlackRock's bad. It's a great company actually. They they do um, a lot for us, uh, research wise. So, and our rep is is a great rep, and they're all good people. But the bottom line is this this whole ESG thing is a marketing scam. Well, that and, and they're trying to select sectors of the economy uh, in the marketplace that, that they think are, are better than others, that, that are either behavior yeah. or product-wise. And, and to exclude any one sector means that you're excluding a portion of the, of the stock market, the investable universe that an investor has available in order to get the gains they need in their portfolio. Here in the ESG fund, the ESGU, they probably are under allocated to energy as you, as you had spoke about. Well, here it's up 92% in the past 12 months. I don't care if you, how small your allocation is, you know, 92%. If you're missing out on a portion of that relative to the S and P 500, you are going to underperform. Well, it should outperform because it carries mid caps where the S and P has a very smidgen of mid cap in it. Right. So ESGU should be outperforming. The only reason why it's even keeping up is because of mid caps, I would argue, that even their large cap selection is underperforming large cap. If we're going to do neck and neck that way, this is just the closest fund that I had to match to the S&P 500. Again, it's not just BlackRock doing it. There's uh, all the companies are coming out now. Even Vanguard is coming out with socially aware funds because, again, it's marketing, it's trendy. And what I'm saying is, look, the world is not, the stock universe is, these are large publicly traded companies. This isn't, you know, micro caps in your backyard that are polluting your creek. These are all very large companies. They're all moving toward these standards, if not already there. Why on earth would you pay five times the premium for it? Because you, if you want to focus long term like we do, 20, 30 years out, that could be a couple hundred thousand dollars that you don't have in your pocket anymore uh, because you just felt good by being ESG, which by the way, <laughs> there is a um, very heated argument in a, uh, I was, I was not present um, for this, uh, but it was a recorded session on investing. It had nothing to do with ESG, but uh, I had someone recently forward it to me. This is lady and this gentleman, and this gentleman stands with me and, and thinking that this is, you know, ESG, you know, it, it it's kind of like this, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> so my aviation days, you taxi out of Hartsfield, you're, you're headed down to the runway and there, there's this little plane. Uh, it's like a Cessna caravan. I know most people probably won't know what that is, but it's a single engine. It, it's a turboprop. But it's a single engine prop holds maybe 12 people. And they were flying, they fly to like Chattanooga and Macon really close. And on the side of the plane, they had the name Echo Jet. There's nothing jet about it. <laughs> right. I mean, I guess sort of in how the engine's made if you want to get technical about it. But that's how I feel with what ESG is. They put this name on the side and so many things, not necessarily BlackRock, they're actually have an ESG strategy, but there's so many products out there that are talking about being socially aware. So much so the SEC is investigating usage of 
the term phrase ESG or socio aware, and it has nothing to do with it. People are just using it for marketing purposes. But anyway, the, the point is, is that in this conversation, this lady came down to, she couldn't beat this guy on this panel on why ESG is bad. And finally she said, well, I just feel better buying it. And that was her whole thing yeah. was that she just felt better buying it. And that's the culture that we live in is that we just feel better doing something. But I promise you, if you buy an ESG fund, you're not making a change at all to any of those factors. Environmental, social, governance. If you buy an ESG fund, you're not contributing to anything to make your cost better. Nothing. If you want to make a difference, join a board, recycle, pick it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> buy a different product. Buy a different product. Yeah. That's how you make a change. You don't make a change because you have an ESG aware portfolio. Now, here in the South, we don't have any demand for this. I never had anyone come to us and say, I want a socially aware or an ESG portfolio. My counterparts in New York, New Jersey, they tell me that's all people are asking for is socially aware portfolios. And vote. That's another one. How you vote. If you don't like something, change who's in power, who makes those decisions, right? Those are all, to me, very logical reasons or logical ways to make change. Not buying an ESG fund where you're putting five times more money into the pockets of already very wealthy companies. Well, one of the things that, that companies like BlackRock did after they promoted ESG funds is then they went around and promoted it with all the companies that the, they're investing in in the yeah. ESG and universe and then wrote letters and talked to board members and would push them in that general direction. So you, you had the ETF sponsor who's marketing to the investors and pushing the boards and, and the management teams all in a way to gather assets for themselves under their auspices that they're the ones who are kind of out looking out for yeah. for, for everyone here. Right. And then you talked about the investor not having necessarily a vote. When you invest through the ETFs, you're giving, you can give that vote to the sponsor. So you're giving your, your vote to the sponsor and you don't know how they're gonna vote and what, what issues are important to them. Because again, they're the, in it for making money. Yeah, okay. right. So how can they get so, another basis point? So yeah. I, I add another layer, and I'm, I'm taking this from your conversation with me two years ago. What happens when ESG performs so poorly that you have to leave it and go back to the S&P 500? Are you, are you now all of a sudden not for ESG? That's right. What's your argument? <laughs> What's your argument? Because <laughs> there is a pain point at which you underperform so much that you realize that you can't, you shouldn't be in this sector. You should, you, or you shouldn't be in this factor. You should be somewhere else. That's why I said I'm not for nor against the whole ESG movement. I just see it as this is what's happening and you can't, you're not going to stop it. And the S&P 500 costs, you know, 0 0.003 of a percent a year. Ba they basically give it to you for free. And it's, it's ranking on environmental, social and governments again is either single A or double A depending on uh, who you look at. And the ESG ranking for a comparable social fund is A or double A, depending on who's rating it. So right. I, I just it, anyway, I, I didn't intend to take this much time to talk about that, but I, I think it's important because so many quarter reports from firms are touting their environmental and social governance stance. And if they are, and they're actually doing it, then good. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead and tell investors say that we're moving in that general direction. You don't have to go outside this investable universe to find good management. That's what their point really is right. at that point there. And so, as you had mentioned, as the S&P as a whole, as an aggregate, moves closer and closer to this standard by which ESG is being judged against, when they all get there, they're there. Right. <laughs> you know, they can't keep moving the goalposts. It's, once no. you're there, they're there. Right. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I believe all 500 companies in the S&P are either almost there or there. Right. And if there's any laggards in that list, it's less than one-tenth of a percent of your portfolio. Yeah. So I, I, I just, ha or maybe in less, maybe less than one one-hundredth of your portfolio, honestly. It, it just frustrates me that we have fiduciaries out there who aren't seeing through this. They're drinking the Kool-Aid and not thinking on behalf of their clients and what they're costing their clients over over the very long term. Right. So you know, I, if you look at the ESG rankings of, of investments that we have, it's very high, very high. We don't have any negatively ranked funds in, well, on our list. In investing, there's, there's all different forms. You know, there, there's speculating, there's uh, investing for for cause or for purpose. We invest for goals. 
Okay, we utilize portfolio construction techniques that produce a portfolio that achieve goals. The investments themselves are less important in that aspect versus somebody who's investing for speculation or investing for cause where the investment becomes the preeminent reason for the portfolio. Our reason for the portfolio is the investor's goals and achievements and desires and wants and, and so on for the term and period that they, they want us to do it for. So since we're already on the topic about portfolios and goals, uh, and I, I will add to that. We're a financial planning firm that also does investment management. Everything starts with a plan. Everything starts with a goal. You just can't go to an asset manager and say, I want this done without understanding the whole, the whole entire picture. That's like going um, to a contractor and say, build me a house. Right. But without a blueprint. Right. Without a plan. Exactly. Yeah. This quarter for our own portfolios, there were no changes. Right. And any of the funds that we're using, uh, there is no rebalancing this quarter. That's something you and I look at every single every, Monday. Every Monday. Uh, we're, we're within our risk tolerance bands on, on each of the models. We are continually looking for other threats and other issues. You know, I looked, kind of dove into emerging markets. And we looked at the emerging markets. China should be a part of the portfolio going forward. That's right. That's right. We did a, a deep dive into that, did a full review, made a decision to maintain our, our position and and VWO, which was the, the Vanguard Emerging Market ETF that contains China. Again, we're investing for a very, very long period of time. At the moment, Chinese government is reviewing, I guess is the nicest way to say it, reviewing its relationship with its capital markets right now. Right. And as such, the investors are you know, selling off a little bit of Chinese and waiting in anticipation to see what's going to happen, see what the ultimate outcome is. But it's going to be very difficult that once capitalism in any form takes root to pull back on that. And the Chinese, you know, I doubt will ever get to the point where they pull back on that to the point where it becomes uninvestable. Um, it's right. the second largest consumer markets in, in the world right now. So, Because well, we all know that China was dabbling in capitalism and decided that they were starting to lose control. So they're, they're starting to pull that back. But our decision was that China only ends up being only like 1.7% of our portfolio. That's right. So even if we said, okay, we're not going to invest in China anymore, it made such an insignificant change in our allocation. It, it just didn't make sense. Because you, you have the China inside the emerging market fund itself. But then when you look at China versus the percentage of the total portfolio, that's how, that's how it gets so small. Right. You know, maybe it's good to have it there, but it was probably not a good thing to completely eliminate it. There's some other things that we're looking at. We'll talk about next quarter um, as far as portfolio structure goes, uh, but we don't foresee any major changes uh, unless we have drastic um, upswing in the markets uh, uh, in the final quarter. Let's hop back over to the economy. Uh, we added 1.65 million more people are working at the end of at the end of this quarter th yeah, the, that last at quarter. the beginning of the quarter so and that's likely to be revised a little upwards again here next month um, it was a, a short month for September in order for them to calculate the number of jobs that were that had been added but you take a look at the 1.695 1.7 million more people going to work every day that's three a months out than 4.8 percent unemployment rate that's somewhat of a and I think most people begin to see through some of this is that as people drop out of the the labor market, you know, looking for work, they no longer are considered part of the labor market. I mean, the potential market. So that I mean, number might be artificially a little bit lower. It, than it, it might be. It, it might be. Based on that, there's, uh, I believe there's still more job openings than we have people to work. That's right. So that would indicate yeah. uh, that that could be the case. Now, an interesting um, metric that we're seeing in, in the marketplace relative to jobs is how long it takes to fill a job right now. Prior to the pandemic, it was taking about 30 days to fill a new job. After the pandemic, there were so many people out of work, anybody was looking for a job, it only took about 20 days to fill a job. There weren't very many to be filled, but those that, you know, right. were, were, that were tracked only took about 20 days. Now it's taking around 50 days to fill every job opening. It takes longer to find people to come to work and do a job on a daily basis right now. You know, a lot of people say it's it's um, has a lot to do with the government paying all these handouts, but a lot of the his handouts have expired at this point. And quite honestly, I think it's people realizing quality of life is better sometimes than the dollar. I mean, we all need to pay the basic, pay the basic needs, I guess. Um, but I know well-paid people that were on the road two weeks 
of the month or three weeks of the month in sales jobs. And they made more money than they ever have in 2020 and doing the same job they just did over Zoom. And now their bosses are saying, we need you back out. We're a face-to-face company. And they're like, I'm not going. I'm not doing it because I've been taking my daughter to school for the last year. And so there's pushback on that. I think the ADP was saying that uh, 93% of employed people are open to ch- uh, changing jobs. You see that people moving out of the city, people aren't going back to the city. So anyway, I think that some of it could be government handouts, but I, I think a lot of it is just people, a certain quality of life that people want now. I think so too. It's going to take a while for the, the handouts as you kind of, you know, the un, in, in increased unemployment benefits uh, to work its way through the system. They're, they're just coming to an end, you know, as of September, right. we're just into the beginning of October. Um, as people begin to ramp up their, their job searches, if, if they do, once those get through the job market placement, what's left, I think is to your point, people who are reevaluating their life. Right. Okay. And that may take a while for for us to uh, actually get metrics on and find some get some data and research on. It. But it should be interesting when we're all done there as we go through this change in our in our work home life. Just to be very clear, your hour commute each way to and from work is is good. It's enjoyable. It's enjoyable. I listen to the radio. You can listen to this podcast. Um, you can do a lot of things, Brad. So don't get any ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that I want to sit home and watch Oprah <laughs> and play with the dog all day. Anyway. Is Oprah still on TV? I don't know. <laughs> Interest rates. I think most people are saying unchanged, but definitely see upward pressure in the future. Maybe yeah, the near there, future. There, there, there's two different what, what what we might pay for anything on an interest rate basis may go higher. We may see that go up. But the Federal Reserve level, they're not increasing rates right now. So we may be seeing rates rise on the 10 year Treasury. We may see you know, rates rise on you know car loans and some other short-term things, but the Federal Reserve is not raising interest rates just yet. Inflation, this is something that everyone, I think it's off the cuff, well, it is off the cuff comments. So inflation is going to be getting out of control. It's going to be six plus percent every single year, maybe 12. It's going to be crazy. Actually, data doesn't support that. Uh, we have supply chain issues. We've got 200 something plus ships waiting to get into just California ports. We were talking about this earlier. Like, right. How's it that only the boats are waiting to go to California? Like, There's no <laughs> boats waiting to go to Savannah, Gulfport, New Jersey. I don't understand that. You know, <laughs> I, I'd like to know more about that. <laughs> if someone as an expert on why only California is waiting. Yeah. I would you know, like to know that. No pun intended, but we don't <laughs> often wade into those waters. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, so inflation, you know, Vanguard's quarterly report uh, indicates that for 2022, they see inflation being uh, uh, as low as 2% for the year of 2022. I think it comes down to solving the supply chain issue. That if as more goods are available, then then prices will come prices will come back down. Yeah, there's actually some some data supporting that, and I agree with you on that, Casey. There's some data supporting that as as inflation from July to August was reported, it had already begun to slow. The rate of increase began to slow in August. So it's interesting to see it may have beginning to change its trajectory. Now, in, in, in July, the year-over-year year was a little over 4%. In August, the year-over-year year was a little over 5% inflation. But that rate of growth had begun to slow. And so it looks like they may be bending that curve a little bit downward. So we'll see how that how that plays out. I think it's going to be an important factor going forward into 2022. Uh, Vanguard's call it 2%. You know, maybe by year end of 2022, in my opinion, or average over the total of 22. But I don't think starting January 1, we're going to see 2%. No, I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, One thing we haven't talked about was the pandemic, uh, COVID part two. Really, I think for most markets, um, it's almost like COVID doesn't exist. And it's more of a verbal fight on vaccinated versus unvaccinated. But it doesn't appear to have been slowing down the economy. Uh, Nothing like last year where we shut things down for sure. Uh, now, now, that may differ from state to state where maybe some restaurants are still closed. My understanding is most of California was open, but Hawaii, I've heard two different reports that as a tourist, it was it was wide open. And as a tourist, it was just a pain to get there. Not as many people were going because of COVID tests and some restaurants were still closed. So that might be true. I, I don't know. But um, I, I think that uh, COVID doesn't have as much of an effect 
on things right now like it did even six months ago. Yeah, as COVID now and, and, and the calendar, you know, kind of go through its phase, you know, as we go through fourth quarter, we're still reporting. Uh, we'll be reporting over fourth quarter of 2020. But as we get into 2022, those 2020 numbers are, are going away. And so we'll begin to see the economy in its real force relative to year-over-year year growth at that point in time because 2021 over 2020 is somewhat of an aberration. We should see some very good numbers. We're expecting 27 to 28% increase in revenue quarter over quarter as third quarter you know, companies begin to report their third quarter earnings. So those year-over-year year numbers of 30% or more may get tamed a little bit. So it should be interesting to see how we how the economy goes into 2022, which is really not that far away because we're already in the fourth quarter now. So it's not unheard of to start, start thinking of it you know, next year. But those year-over-year -year comparisons are going to change. We'll see how investors react to that. There's a lot of positivity for quarter four as far as market performance goes. A lot. Um, There's a lot of you know, positives. There's still a lot of liquidity in the marketplace. There's a lot of cash swashing around out there. Interest rates, as we just talked about, are still at historic lows. So companies are able to borrow. They're able to reposition their balance sheets for strength. Okay, they can invest in research and development at a fairly low cost of capital. Still, we are an expanding economy right now. The growth is still on a trajectory. The Federal Open Market Committee has expects the year to end somewhere in the neighborhood 5.9 to 6 percent annualized growth in, the, in GDP, which is a very large number historically. COVID cases are decreasing. Okay, we're seeing the latest uh, Delta variant trend turn over a little bit on a seven-day average and begin to move downward. Vaccinations are not quite at the rate that people had hoped, but nonetheless, people are still getting vaccinated and we're still developing immunity to, to, to this virus. And then, you know, employment. Job numbers are going up. People are going back to work. There is going to be changes. It was quite a disruption in, in, the, in the job market. But when you're looking at 1.5 to 2 million people going to work every quarter that had not been working in the previous quarter, that does a couple of things. That increases the number of people paying taxes and it decreases the amount of outflow that the government is paying in benefits to keep these people you know, in, a, in a livable situation. So we're working at both ends of the, of the, of the situation there. And I guess the final thing we've uh, actually we've had I think over 700 views now on our uh, tax uh, talk we did on on our YouTube channel about you know potential changes coming from uh, I don't even want to say the White House it's the White House doesn't really seem to be driving anything right now it appears to be uh, mostly Congress and, and the Senate on the new tax uh, or stimulus plan or whatever they want to call it we're making a lot of radical changes but really it appears to be one or two Democrats that are putting the brakes on uh, a $3.5 trillion spending plan, maybe even getting it dropped by a trillion possibly in expenses or in programs. But the most important thing is what Biden can't campaigned on. Uh, none of that is really going to come to fruition that we seem to have amongst the democratic party itself, uh, some reconciliation now on a reasonable tax increase. Uh, after COVID, I don't see how you can't justify a tax increase. You got to pay for this stuff somehow. But we're not going to extreme tax rates on corporations, middle class, uh, upper middle class, especially small business owners are, I think, getting the brunt of it. But um, they'll survive. They'll survive. This is still this is still the only country in the world people come to start companies in. You know, we we still have the best business environment. Okay? Yeah, and still have the best, <laughs> the highest intellectual capital you know, in our, in our labor force of anywhere in the world. So, well, we'll end on that. Uh, both parties seem to be America first these days. So I think that's great for, for business and for entrepreneurs. And we will um, uh, absorb tax hikes just like everyone else does or did in the past. And we'll continue to find ways to make money. Thanks, Sounds Brad. great. Enjoy the conversation. Thanks for listening to the Wiser Roundtable podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss out on new episodes. Head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out if you have any questions. We would love to hear from you. Today's episode was produced and edited by Lilton Moore.